Hi there everyone. Sometimes we look at people and think they just got lucky or they got a hookup from an uncle or a dad. But the truth is, irrespective of who you are, where you are or what you've been through, you can make it and do amazing things. I am so thrilled to have with me Ken Kanu, the CEO of Britam Asset Managers, who's going to be sharing with us his journey that I think is so amazing. So stay tuned and listen to this amazing journey. Hi Ken. Hi, Rina. Thank you so much for accepting to do this interview. Great, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So I, I wanted us to start from the beginning and right. just hear about your background because, I mean, you're such a, an amazing person who's done amazing things well, uh, really, really knowledgeable in the field of finance and investment. Right. And I've watched you literally grow. That's right. <laughs> we were in high school together, no, except I was right. ahead of you. No, that's right. And it's just been amazing to watch your journey. Right. And I am totally inspired right. and mm. I admire admire the way that you've, you know, sort of just come into yourself right. um, in your journey. Right. So let's take a few steps back okay. and um, yeah, tell us about your upbringing and your family of origin. Okay. Um, thank you for having me, Rina. Uh, I've just turned 40, so that has given me some pause for thought and mm. just some time to reflect on the journey that I've taken. So yeah. I do think that this interview is wonderful because it has allowed me to be able to, to do that. And happy birthday. No, thank you, thank <laughs> you very much. It was about um, maybe a month and a half ago. Oh really, that's just? Right. Oh, that's right, so still enough time to receive a gift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's coming. Thank you, thank you, Rina. <laughs> yeah, so I was born in 1980, which is a, a strange time because uh, for someone who's 40, in some respects, you're seen to be fairly old mm. and advancing in age. But in other respects, I'm still seen to be fairly young. So amongst my colleagues and peers and so on and so forth, you know, there goes the young guy again. Yes. And amongst uh, maybe other people, uh, you know, 40 is too much. And 40 is simply too old. Mm. And by the time I turn 40, I think I'll be in my grave. You know, those are, those are some <laughs> of the comments that I hear from others. So yeah. it's, a strange, uh, it's a strange age. But nevertheless, um, if I talk about my origin and upbringing and so on and so forth, I guess it was what I'd call fairly uh, routine and normal. So we grew up in, in what I'd call the early 80s doing all the normal stuff that people do. Mm. So, you know, um, is the age of black and white TVs becoming color. So mm. pretty excited about Kiddy Macho and football made in Germany. Uh, we were all eating the goody goodies, you know, the nice, yeah. uh, the nice toffees yeah. and so on and so forth, playing a lot outside. Um, I wouldn't really, especially when I was younger, you know, in primary school and so on, I don't think I would characterize myself as academically astute. Mm -hmm. Really? But, but I would say I was academically reasonable, let, okay. let me put it that way. So I started off in uh, kindergarten, I went to Nairobi Primary School uh, for three years, uh, maybe four if I count uh, the pre-primary and so on and so forth. So that is where I got my taste of uh, uh, the free milk, the nyayo milk, which mm. was lovely. I really enjoyed it. Mm. Maybe that is why the teeth are white. <laughs> <laughs> when I look at my kids, I, I wonder, are they really going through the same or not? <laughs> so that was a fantastic uh, experience. Yeah. And it was great being in, um, uh, great being in a public school. Um, you learn like everybody else. I uh, got hammered like everybody else. In fact, those are some of the enduring memories uh, that I then have. Yeah. And I then moved to um, a private uh, Catholic school in 1990. Okay. Um, so I think I was in class four. So that was St. Mary's School. Mm. It was seen to be a good school. And I was very fortunate that my, my parents were able to afford to take me there. So I then went through the motions, uh, played a lot of sports uh, while I was there. I remained um, academically reasonable, so I did not progress from there. <laughs> But, um, you know, I uh, went through KCSE and was quite excited to be done uh, with school. Mm. Yeah, so that's when I realized I'm more analytical in nature. I think it takes, um, it took me a bit longer to work through the stuff. So I'd always question, you know, why must the algebra be done this way? Does it even make sense? I'm not sure I understand it. That's interesting. So because when you take longer to understand something, the thinking for yourself and those around you is that you're slow. That's right. You know, and so you kind of feel I'm not as fast as these other kids. So what gave you that insight to, you know, to, to align that with the fact that you are naturally analytical? Well, um, and to some extent as well, the, 
the questioning was seen as a sign of defiance. Mm. Why is he asking? You know, um, this is too much. Why can't you just do it like the rest? Uh, the rest can. So it called. It made me think that, you know, maybe there's a different way of doing things. So I started to then find in myself that um, I seem to take my time, try and think through, try and come up with something that is logical and makes sense for me. Mm. So I realized that very early on, uh, not even in my career, but in my development as a person, that seems to be how I was wired. Because remember, I'm doing that at the age of 15 and 16 and 17. Okay. And when I would then go through extra classes, then I would say, oh, okay, so that is the way that it works. And then it would stick. So I found myself that way. I find my firstborn son that way as well. He seems to take after me also. Uh, and obviously you are then able to deepen your thoughts and so on and so forth. So it, it kind of became natural that I would then, and I'll talk a bit about my career, then move towards investment management rather than banking, which is where I first started. Right. Because uh, banking is banking, the rules are already set. Um, you don't have too much room to move outside those parameters. Uh, but I found that with investments, you do. You have the time to think through. Mm. You have the time to reflect, and you have the time to come up with a reasonable, um, let me say, recommendation at the end of the yeah. day. I also, uh, at school, um, seemed to like English, for whatever reason. So I'm very fortunate that I was encouraged to read a lot of books, particularly in school and also at home. So I went through the whole Enid Blyton uh, series. Yeah. For those who remember Enid Blyton, yeah. uh, I went through Hardy Boys, went through Nancy Drew, went through Secret Seven, yeah. went through quite a bunch of stuff. So that was very useful because I later then realized uh, that life is also about articulation. So it's not important for you to know what you know, it's also important for you to be able to communicate right. what you know in a language that people can understand. But see, that's just too much maturity for me. I'm like, you are a kid. How are you able to just think in that way? Is that the way that you were brought up? Is it your parents who are, you know, sort of pushing you in that direction? My parents' uh, core methodology was, uh, if you don't do well, um, well, firstly, it's up to you. Uh, you really don't have anything here. Even these clothes that you have, they've been bought for you. In any case, you'll have to grow them anyway. It's not something you can say is even yours. So that was um, the methodology. Um, some people would argue maybe that is too harsh and so on and so forth. But that's the sense that I got. Um, I even remember um, being asked many times, you truly, what have you done? You know, maybe you're on TV watching tennis and you're celebrating because once again, uh, Serena Williams or Martina Hingis, those are the guys we, people we used yeah. to watch have won. Yeah. So the message was, why are you even excited watching Martina Hingis win? You, have you won? When you win, that's when I want to see you smile until wow. that, that back tooth I can see you showing there. Mm. So that was the methodology. So that kind of um, made me and my younger brother realize, we're just two, that you have, it's truly up to you. There's no safety net, you have to walk off and do something useful because there's going to be no real uh, support at the end of the day and you don't want to then look like you're the one who seems to have issues. I think that was the methodology. Mm. Um, I think for the most part it seems to work because we couldn't bear to contemplate the alternative. Yeah. Where truly you are, you are battling, you've not done well in school and, and so on and so forth. Those were also the days when everything was really um, academic, let me put it that way. The methodology was you do well in school and you go off and get what is seen to be a regular career. So you should be a doctor, or you should be a lawyer, or you should be a banker, and so on and so forth. Uh, other professions and careers were frowned upon. So anything to do with your own innate talent was not looked at positively. So you want to become a sports person, why don't you have that as a hobby, rather than contemplate that as a career? Mm -hmm. Or you're good in art and so on, it's good for you to be good in art, but truly, what do you really want to do in life? Yeah. Uh, media wasn't a big thing then. You know, that we, we were growing up watching Catherine Kazabuli. I mean, that was not something that a normal Kenyan aspired to, as an example. Uh, there was no social media at all. So that as a career was, was completely out. So in those days, it was quite rigid. It's not the way it is now where truly you can say, uh, I'm going to be in media. Mm. Or I'm going to become a guitar player. Yeah. Or I'm going to become a, a painter. Or I'm going to become a DJ, uh, as an example. And all of those are, are worthwhile careers. 
they now pay. Mm -hmm. You can actually raise a family on that and have grandchildren off the back of that. Mm -hmm. You can build a house, buy a car, you can do all the regular stuff. That wasn't available to us at that particular age and for you as well, yeah. I'm sure. That was seen to be maybe frivolous mm -hmm. and too self, um, you know, you're too self-absorbed. That's not the real world, you know. Mm. So that was a message that, that, that we all got. got yeah. Yeah. And um, who knows, we could have been doing something completely different, um, particularly for me and my younger brother. But we, uh, we are where we are. My mother was a civil servant. She was a civil servant for 35 years. And um, obviously for her, life was quite, quite routine. You know, you clock in and you clock out and so on and so forth. And uh, you look at a civil servant and a guitar player, you know, the, the two don't mix, particularly where a career then is concerned. Yeah. Um, you know, my father was uh, initially a corporate guy, uh, more like me, but he quit in, after 10 years, despite having done very well in the auto industry and went into business. So he then had his own methodology and, and view of life. And their view of life was, we just want these guys to grow up to be normal, stable, uh, people, I think that was the sense. So keep their noses clean, keep them out of trouble. Uh, don't talk to girls, girls are very bad. And also they should not talk to you either. <laughs> <laughs> so I always suspect maybe that is why we went to St. Mary's because no, remember, there were no girls. St. Mary's was an all boys school. Yes. So in one way that is very good, but in one way that is also very bad, isn't it? So we got introduced to the world of girls very late. <laughs> uh, my mother was the only uh, lady in the house, but to her she's not a lady, she's a mother. Yes. So truly things are, are quite different. Yeah. But that is how we, um, I think that is how we grew up, mm. in a very kind of, um, in one way normal environment, but in another way quite uh, disciplined and structured, uh, structured environment. So I'd not really say that we lacked for, uh, for anything, and um, I do give credit to, to them for what they did. Uh, there are some hang-ups that, of course, that I have, like we all have, to be honest, as a result of what then happened. But when I look at the whole thing on, 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 on the whole, I look at the whole balance, um, it seems to have worked, let me put it that way. Yeah, they yeah. did a great job. Yeah. All in all. We all in all. All in all. Fantastic. Thank you for that background. Sure. So, you know, were you always inclined to invest and yeah. to, you know, build your wealth and that yeah. sort of thing? I mean, you've been in investment, in the investment field for a long time. Yeah. Uh, where did that come from and where did you get your wake-up call? Not so much the career, but just yeah. that interest in being an analyst and investing yourself. I, well, I wouldn't um, say that it was a wake-up call. Because when you have a wake-up call, it means something bad has happened. Yeah, true. Right? So I don't think anything bad really happened. Okay. It's just that, um, you know, um, so immediately I then finished high school. I went to USIU for university. And before I went to USIU, I then got my first job working at, um, um, at a Kenchik uh, shop in Moy Avenue, actually the first one uh, that was set up in Nairobi. So my job for nine months was to um, bag chips and cut chicken and serve it. So very interesting. So you know how to cut chicken properly. I know how to cut chicken properly, that's the thing. Though that was many years ago, but yes, I, I was doing that for nine wow. months. So first the nightmare was when someone would say, give me 30 fries and 30 chicken, I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I had to take some 30 minutes. <laughs> so very interesting, um, very interesting experience. And um, I then learned a bit about how to run a business and money as mm. well. Because sometimes I'd run the cash register also. So you then learn that the money comes from customers, right? And the right. customer is just a normal person. Yeah. Come and ask you, give me a Fanta Passion and some chips. Mm. That's it. And he'll give you 100 shillings. But that 100 shillings will become 20,000 for the day. So you then realize that you need to treat these people well, um, otherwise they're not going to come back. Right. So we then had a lot of value adds. We had a lot of kachumbari that we used to serve. So we'd cut up onions and tomatoes and so on and so forth and put it in these big um, like vases or dishes and put them strategically around the, the shop. And we realized they were a hit. Mm. It was free. Some people would come just for the catching bag. <laughs> so of course there was the big debate, are we going to chase them away or not? Yeah. We decided to leave them. So we then learn about uh, decisions. We had initially seats inside the Kenchik, and then we realized to turn the tables faster is better that we have um, 
no seats, just you know those benches yes, that are I there. Yes, I remember. Yeah, that's right. That's you stand and eat. Yes, you stand and eat and go because we don't want you sitting there for two hours. Yeah. Remember, there's a line outside. Right. So you then learn a bit about um, uh, the decision making. So I was there for nine months, enjoyed myself. I had to throw away the clothes when I was done. They are unwashable after that and unwearable, full of oil and mafuta yeah. and all that. Yeah. So then went into USIU and studied a normal um, uh, business, uh, business administration degree, nothing special about that. And um, towards the end of my university in my third year, I then I uh, came across uh, an association called ISAC, which I thought was very good. Mm. So it was a student activity in a student club. There are lots of student clubs. I just stumbled upon that one. But the benefit of joining a student organization is that you then learn a bit more. So obviously they, they have some H HR function to organize members. You can take up a finance role. You can take up a marketing role where you engage with companies. Or you can be the leader or you can get involved in their core business. So I thought that was particularly useful for me now that I think about it. I didn't think it was useful then, but now I can see why it was useful. Because that is where I learned how to write a proposal to a company. What role to, did you take? I took on um, a role that was called Incoming Exchange. The core work of ISAC is to, stand, is to send Kenyans abroad to give them work experience and cultural experience mm -hmm. as well, and also receive foreigners into Kenya and show them about our culture and also give them good work experience with companies. So my role was to, was to actually um, receive the foreigners and make sure that they had placements within companies and also make sure they had a good cultural experience. So my role was to engage companies and NGOs and whatever it was and tell them the benefits of ISAC. It's great to have a foreign intern with you for six months. Mm -hmm. They'll come with a different culture uh, because he's gone to university, maybe a different work ethic and different knowledge. Right. And by the time he leaves, hopefully there's some impact on your business. Mm. And we'll handle the work permit. You just have to pay him a little stipend and so on and so forth. So some companies thought it was great and others thought it was just a waste of time. But you see, you learn how to write those proposals. You have to go and meet people. Um, others will just tell you this is a waste of time. Yeah. Others will tell you, well, I'll think about it. And others would proceed. So that to me was something very useful because I felt like you're part of a small company. So I thought that was great. Uh, you have to learn how to talk and to do a little public speaking right. and so on and so forth. So at the time it was just a little activity but really now I can see the benefit of having gone through that because it gave me the confidence then to be able to proceed. And it's only now that I've, when you reflect through that you're able to you know, appreciate the value of that. Yeah. But at the time I was just a student you know, you're 19, you're 20, I mean, really? Yeah. You do. Let me just do it and move on, you know, that kind of thing. But it I also gives you networks. It also gives you networks, yeah. that's right. And those, those networks are very useful also. Yeah. So when I then joined, left university, mm -hmm. I then took up a national role uh, within ISAC, so responsible for all the universities in Kenya, mm -hmm. again, doing the same thing. You then uh, take on more leadership, more decision making, but it introduced a lot of conflict between me and my parents principally because um, they thought that this is, um, you're in summary volunteering for a role in an association that doesn't pay, so we can't see the benefit. Yeah. And all your peers are off, either working or tarmacking or whatever. When are you going to start? In fact, these people are going to leave you behind, mm. Ken. You'll always be one or two years behind because of this whole ISEC thing. So just quit and do something useful. And there was a lot of conflict because during my university years, I, I didn't live at uh, university. I stayed off campus in Risambo and uh, Zimmerman and those areas. That was my decision to go and do that. So when I then went back home, of course, you are re being reintroduced to your parents in a manner that is not also very good. So conflict, because you've been independent for a while. No, that's right. So every morning, wake up, uh, take my matatu to University of Nairobi. That's where the office was located. Spend time there until maybe eight in the evening and go home, you know, that kind of thing. Or not go home at all, you know, I would take, um, every chance I could not to go home. I'm in a conference, I'm in a meeting, I'm in the sleepover, I'm in whatever. So it wasn't the best uh, time, but I think for me very useful in as far as contacts, decision making, and just some level of uh, responsibility. So when I finished up with my ISEC term in, in 2004, in mid-2004, I was fortunate that I immediately got a job through ISEC. Mm. Because I was in contact with many companies and all that, yeah. When I told them I was winding up, they were like, oh, why don't you join one of our programs? 
So I joined CBA uh, as a graduate trainee and uh, went through the motions, uh, sitting in branches. I was even a teller for a while, yeah. um, service delivery, blah, blah, blah. And I quickly realized that this is not what I want to spend my life doing because banking is very regimented, mm. banking rules. We don't want thinkers, what yeah, we just want think. is... Uh, Analyze what? Yes, just count the money and go yeah. home. What's your issue? <laughs> and even better, we have a camera above you, so it's okay. <laughs> you don't have to worry. All yes. your customer engagements, you know, fine. Yeah. Or if today you are approving RTGSs, well, there's no RTGS at the time. Yeah. If you're approving these EFTs, just approve them and move on. We yeah. really don't need you. In fact, we have pre-printed the paper. So truly, just take the paper and, and use it. So I realized that's not what I wanted. Not very interesting, counting other people's money, very regimented environment. So because I was responsible for hosting Kenyans here, I also had some contacts with other companies and countries uh, outside. So I then came across several programs for several companies which were looking for um, international people. And of course, a Kenyan is an international person, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> which, which, I, which I think is good. So I went through some interviews with several of these entities, um, oral interviews, written interviews, and so on. Unfortunately, at the time, I was studying for my CFA exams. So me and some fellow from France then qualified to join a company called Allianz in Germany, mm. uh, having gone through the, the application process. So I went there for just more than a year, and that is where I got to grip with uh, investments. And you learn that people are keen about what they do. Uh, I then realized that there's no such thing as a generalist. You're supposed to be a specialist. And when you take your radio to be fixed, the guy who's fixing it understands radios deeply. Mm. He understands about radio waves and so on and so forth. So he'll do a good job. But he can't tell you anything about TVs. No. There's somebody else who does TVs. And as a result, he's then well paid because of the specialization. Mm. So in Kenya, you realize you take your radio to be fixed. The guy does everything, washers, Phones. cookers, Phones, like radiate, it. takes it apart, and puts it back in a manner that really doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> so you realize people are very different out there. So I learned a lot about work ethic and all that. And I realized then I think investments is what I want to do because you're paid to think through. Mm. It's really down to your own analytical ability and all that. Super. So what was your first investment right. as Ken when you got back home? Right. Mm. My first investment uh, was made in the year 2006. I had just come back to Kenya from, uh, from Germany, from with Allianz, and lucky once again in that I was able to find a job. I was able to find a job because for the year that I was out, mm -hmm. I kept in contact with people. So, hi, how are you? This is what I'm doing, this is what I'm up to, this is what I'm trying to do, blah, blah, blah. Merry Christmas to you and happy mm -hmm. birthday to your young son and all that. So, when I then came back, at least I had people to tell that Put I was back, back yeah. which, which was useful. So one of them gave me an internship, which was great. And because he thought I was reasonable, it later converted into a contract job and then into a full-time job. So whilst I was going through that process in 2006, I then made my first investment in a company called Uchumi. Um, you know, that I thought Uchumi was doing very well. Uh, I was a young analyst. I mean, I've just come from Germany, so I know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> so not only did I invest some money, I also successfully managed to convince my mother and brother to put in money to also put in money into Uchumi. So there were a lot of rumors swelling around the company. Um, you know, management is not good. They are cash flow negative, and despite everything you see on the shelves and all the activity in the branches, they you know there were rumors. The company at the time then changed CEOs. Uh, they brought in a, a white South African. I've never forgotten his name. His name was John Masterson Smith. I've never forgotten his name because he's the one who lost me the money, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so he then called a press conference and kind of just gave confidence to everybody that I'm here. Mm. This is my five-year plan and it's going to work. So I looked at the press conference, thought he had a nice suit and all that. I believed him in summary mm. and we put in the money. Um, I think a week later on Madaraka Day, for those who remember, the Uchumi closed. There were closed shut signs in every branch. In fact, it was shocking for the whole country. It was shocking. Uchumi, it was on Uchumi every, has closed. Yes, it was on every newspaper, That's every right. TV station. And the company has been suspended from trading. Yeah. And now, and what then later happened is that the government then decided to come up with a rescue plan. They yeah. put in some money. And the message to all, all of us as investors was that you had just lost your money. Mm. 
and it was it was horrific because um, prior to that they had also done a rights issue, meaning they went to raise additional money from shareholders. So there are a lot of new investors and old investors who also put in money. So we were all uh, left asking questions. You know, where was the management mm -hmm. and uh, even the auditor at the time? Who was he? Uh, that is when we were, we learned about the CMA. What was the CMA then doing? So we completely lost all our funds. And I then, on, re on reflection, then realized I didn't do the work. Because you see, I was perhaps overconfident. Mm. I relied in my own ability to just read the situation. Uh, I didn't do the work. I didn't do the research. I didn't look at the financial statements. I didn't ask around. You didn't look at the financial statements? No. I simply just invested because I thought that was the right thing to do. Uh, it's like now telling somebody, why don't you go and invest in our, our top performing company in Kenya? Mm. I think we all know that one. Yeah. Um, most people are, have not looked at those financial no, statements. No, they're like, we, yeah. I mean, surely. Is, so is, it, is, it, is it going to collapse tomorrow? No, it's too no. huge to collapse. It's too and huge government to collapse. owns it. Absolutely. <laughs> That's how we felt about Uchumi. Yeah. I mean, the entire, is in the milk I'm drinking from Uchumi? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going back there tomorrow, right. and I'm still going to find the same milk, yeah. and so on and so forth. So that was this. Uchumi was that kind of company in 2006. They had even they had a wonderful CEO who had just put in a very expensive ERP system. I don't know if you remember. I, remember. Um, I mean, it was going places. Very modern, mm. you know, inventory check. You made the, who wouldn't have put money in Uchumi? Mm. So we all did. So I mean. So I learned a lot about taking your time, being patient, ask the right questions, look at the numbers. Don't invest because the guy looks good yeah. or based on the reputation uh, of the company. Because if you do that, um, there are only two uh, options here. It can either go very right or go very wrong. And, and for, your, for your family, I guess like your mom who invested, it's don't invest because your son has told you or your mother or that's your cousin the thing, is investing. That's the right? thing, yeah. You so, have to do your own work. So it was a knock to my confidence because <laughs> uh, first of all, you, so you say this is the career that you want, Ken. Eh? Just tell us about that again. How does, it, how does this industry really work, Ken? <laughs> Just explain to us once again. Yeah. Huh? And you say you even did this in Germany. In Germany. Yeah? Is that, how is, is, that how, is that how it normally works? <laughs> so, <laughs> so not very interesting. Yeah. So it took me a while to recover from that. So you kind of tell yourself, never again. If ne I, never if again I what? Never yeah. again invest or make a decision without going through the whole process. So you'd rather get a failure, but take comfort in the fact that you went through the process. Right. So it's fine. Yeah. And of course, the process helps you to avoid, hopefully, too many of those kinds of failures. Mm. Uh, but if you don't go through a process, then the chances of being scammed and conned and making a decision based on emotions and all that is high. Mm -hmm. And most of the time when you do that, it doesn't work. Uh, but when you do, um, you become a bit more logical than you realize. You're able to catch some of these things early on. You can't catch everything. It's not even expected that you catch everything. But if you catch 80% of them, that's good. That's normal. In investments, 20% of them have to be bad. So it's not a perfect environment. But if it's the other way around, where 80% of the money is lost mm. and 20% of the time you're Beginning. right, then there's something wrong yeah. with what you are doing. So yeah. the, the first one has, is a total loss, then that's not, uh, that's not very interesting. So the guys even remind me until today, oh, you know, Ken, you know, you know we once lost some money. Yeah? <laughs> it's a very nice and very, very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, super. And then, so now I want us to go into your journey to being CEO. I mean, you right. became CEO quite... Mm. Uh, young, right. um, in an industry that is full of older, more you know, experienced yeah. people. Yeah. Um, how did you How did you get here? Right. In, in In summary. Yeah. Um, I would say in summary, um, it's very interesting. I went against the grain a lot because I started off with in Kenya with a company called um, uh, Stanvik Investments. It was part of the Standard Bank Group. Yeah. So I started as an analyst, and um, every one or two years, I had a serious uh, opportunity to change jobs. 